Hi, I'm Elizabeth Bowman, and this is the Opera Glasses Podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Italian-Canadian soprano and principal at Cesaroni Consulting, Lucia Cesaroni. Lucia not only writes for Opera Canada, but has also established an international opera career, singing with companies in Italy, the United States, and Canada. She lives between Toronto, New York, and Italy, and employs her skills and discipline as a performer, as well as her international network to coach executives and teams. Her clients have included Salesforce, WeWork, Bell Canada, Google, Forward Together, and many more. I'm so glad she's here. So let's talk to my friend, Lucia. Lucia, welcome to the Opera Glasses podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Lizzie. You know, I love you. Happy to be here. Also, yeah, happy birthday. <gasps> Thanks. It's a festival, you know, it's all month long. So Yeah. I, I hear it's a big birthday, but I won't I won't talk it about is. that. I think I think it's wonderful. You gotta <laughs> celebrate these things. Okay, so let's circle back. We've been working together since since I joined, and you've been working with the magazine before I joined Opera Canada. And mm -hmm. so before I joined, you had your, your own column that expressed the goings-on in the business. And yeah, I, I said to Gianmarco at the time, do you realize you don't have a singer writing regularly for your magazine? Does that not strike you as odd, out of balance? And uh, yeah, so... I was writing um, with Gianmarco on sort of more general topics, singer's point of view, insider perspective, and then you came into my life. <laughs> well, I found when when we first chatted, I found I found you had a, a very sort of unique perspective, not just from the perspective of of a singer, which is of course an important perspective to have in the magazine, but you you have business acumen that I think that many might not necessarily have to the degree that you have. You run a consulting company, right? Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? As so many of us experienced during the pandemic, uh, you know, full calendar to empty calendar in a very short space of time. And so I pivoted, started Cesaroni Consulting, and now I balance that with my performing. So in the consulting sphere, I go into corporate America and I teach performance skills, dealing with nerves, communication skills, listening skills, presentation, all the things a singer has practiced intentionally for many years and can be translated into the corporate sphere, wherein there is desperate need of charisma and, you know, energy and a, a, a truly unique perspective. And so I come to Amer the corporate space with a beginner's mindset, having very few sort of preconceptions. And I bring, you know, the sequins, as I like to say, or the, or the, or the eyelashes either. Um, but it's, it's great because I learn a lot too. I, I, we, I think we as artists still don't recognize our value extra industry. You know, so that's that's how you, I sort of pitched to you. We need to talk about how artists have value everywhere because this is a particular it's a challenge everywhere, but it's a particular challenge in the classical music space and in Canada where, you know, arts are still and artists are still sort of considered the first thing to be cut in a budget, the frill, the extra. And yet, quite to the contrary, I am putting in black and white the truth that the people who make the big money and and are the engines of our economy need us. So that's what we write about now. Right. Yeah. Well, congratulations on a very successful pivot in a in a really tough time. I know all the artists were struggling, but not all were able to sort of put their ducks in a row like that and find a sort of new niche that complements all your stage work. And I love that you're continuing to do it. And through our conversations, we agree that it would be good to have you take on, I guess it's not new anymore, but when did we start the stage business and essential fall. perspectives in the fall issue, fall. 2022? That's it. And your first interview was with Kate Pizzaroni, who is fantastic, digital yeah. marketing, yeah. design, all the things visual. She's so fantastic. I was so glad to have her perspective in the magazine. And also from your perspective, it was great. Can you tell us a bit about the conversation you had with her? Well, first of all, 
I liked her immediately. I mean, the three of us have had subsequently wonderful times in New York together. I'm very, very glad that I got that opportunity to meet her in the context, you know, with you as the connector, because apropos, um, we all really connect on the importance of aesthetic beauty for beauty's sake, um, and design as a serious thing. Again, not a frill, not an afterthought, but, um, it's not just content. It has to be the how, um, the delivery system has to also be beautiful. We are artists. We're in the creative sphere after all. And I think classical music, and this is something she spoke to a lot, classical music and performing arts in general undervalue the importance of, of design and beauty and, um, all the things surrounding the art itself and the content itself, right? Which can only enhance. And she's been a part of some really cool projects because her clients are, you know, the most important classical musicians in the world. Um, Yuja and Joyce Cidonato, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they are really sort of at the, at the vanguard of cool in our industry. If there's such a thing as cool in opera, I don't know, the jury's out on that, but <laughs> you get my meaning. Uh, the idea that... They want to interact with their audiences more. They want to find more opportunities, not just that the poster is beautiful, right? But mm -hmm. that they actually are uh, before and after the show and even during finding innovative ways to connect and bring the audience in, remove the intimidation factor, remove the frankly, preciousness and pretentiousness that I call out a lot. If you read my columns, <laughs> you, you do. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> listeners read my columns. Um, there's just simply isn't time for that anymore. And Kate really gets that. And her artists with whom she works really gets that. So yeah, it, it was, that uh, was a really fun interview and we're, and we became fast friends. So how, how you frame that with the importance of design, uh, it just reminded me of, you know, Mar do you know Marshall McLuhan? He was a yeah, philosopher. Yeah. yeah. The medium, the medium is a message. And that really sort of rings true here when I hear you say that, because yeah, Kate really has this 3D view of a project. When you look at just Joyce Dudonato's Eden project, you can see all the levels, like they, they handed out seeds the audience and so that they can continue to grow uh, with, with the experience that they just had. So it's, it's an all encompassing thing. And then also the essential perspectives being um, a column about people, I guess, mm -hmm. with subjects that aren't necessarily marinating in opera, but are successful in another industry. I love this column. I think it's very important for our business, especially as we consider ways to to grow or yeah. maybe move in a new direction like well i think so first of all you are exemplary of this notion what i pitched to you was we don't have to reinvent the wheel we need to look at what's already being done well elsewhere and implement adapt be a little more agile actually do some change management here um and as I said, I think you coming from communications and PR and understanding like that to me is a, is a perfect example of someone coming from outside of opera who can lend a lot to opera, best practices, right? How it's being done well in another sector, but a sector that's adjacent enough that they're going to be the Venn diagram has, you know, multiple overlaps. And, and so we've, you know, I've leveraged my both my personal and professional network to talk to people like Deborah Lau Yu, who is an entrepreneur and leader in the Chinese Canadian community, about how can we meaningfully build community um, using arts as the nexus point around which to rally, around which to bring people in this, you know, I use this phrase a lot, as much as geography is destiny. And we have this huge sprawl in Toronto and in Canada, right? It's, it's actually representative of the whole country. How can we bring people together and all these amazing and very successful immigrant communities to opera? Um, and so I talked to her. I talked to my dear friend, um, Derek, who is an entertainment lawyer, Derek Chua, about, again, he's also a theater producer, which is interesting, again, adjacent enough. And then um, a client of mine and friend, executive at Salesforce, Julie Hansen, we talked about what are some of the best practices in a 
tech company, right, that we can implement easily, fluidly into a creative art space. Um, and the, I'll never forget this insight, um, which was she wanted to talk a little bit about marketing and how can we create, how can we use opera as an event to market opera. So, which is to say using the example of Airbnb, which I won't get into now because it's a bit, you know, detail heavy. The point being learning from the lessons Airbnb garnered during the pandemic, we can create a multi phase or stage event in which opera plays like a third or even a quarter of the, of the parts, right? So it has, it has to start with cocktails or a TV. Then we have something opera then, or performing arts in general, right? Or it's site specific, but then we go to dinner. Then we have, we have a place most importantly, where we can come together and we've just had this shared experience of big emotions. It's got to go somewhere. Like where does that energy go? And we don't do that very well. And so that was one of the biggest insights of all the people that I've interviewed for essential perspectives a person outside of opera had this very um, incisive uh, commentary and 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 sort of constructive feedback for the industry, which is we could be creating events, not just a production of an opera. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it makes um, absolute sense when you think of what people are doing post post pandemic, what the importance of an experience of an all encompassing thing. That's what people are buying tickets for. Now they want to have multi-layered experiences and they want something that is conversation starting and not something where they're, they're sort of passively being entertained and then no. they leave. Lizzie, I don't want to do that. I'm <laughs> sorry. I don't want to sit at the opera for four hours. I am an opera singer and I don't want to do that. I want to experience, I want to have a place I want to be moved and experience the joy of classical music, but then I want to be able to digest it and talk about it and make sense of it with other interesting people. For example, um, the thing is, this is actually happening all around us slowly. I mean, there are really cool iterations. And in the latest uh, column that I wrote, I name checked a few of them. Um, Symphony in, in the Gardens at Casa Loma is very, they're doing this. For, with my, with, I partnered with my business, the, with the Italian Contemporary Film Festival in the distillery, which does this incredible, I wish more people knew about this. Um, we did a huge event, opera event with them, where we did just that. We created a VIP pre lounge and after party, and then 90 minutes of Carmen in the middle. And the most important piece that I wish opera would do more, I collected a lot of data. So I did surveys before and after I talked to people, I got everybody's information. Um, and I'm going to leverage that because I can prove, you know, the dollar value to businesses, right? I brought specifically corporate clients together. We can be doing so much more of this. It's again, none of this is reinventing the wheel. I'm not suggesting anything that doesn't already exist in similar iterations elsewhere. I just want to see, I do want to see our institutions in Canada pull together more. You know, uh, we've, we've got Banff and we've got, you know, the COC and we've got the ROM, you know, like I want to, what's, what's the partnership there? How can, how can all of those, cause they're not all the same audiences at all. They bring yeah. a totally different demos of, of Canadians. And I want to smash them together and see what they think. And what do they want to see? I want to just say on this topic for a couple of years, I was the executive director of the, the Amici chamber ensemble yeah. in Toronto. When I came on board, the, uh, the financial situation was dire. I mean, which is a common issue in mm -hmm not-for-profit uh, organizations. Anyway, the only way out was through what I, what I called cultural collaboration, right? Uh, we needed help presenting. So I reached out to um, the Toronto International Film Festival and we did a partnership with them. We did a, a, a concert with them um, with, with film 
and music or, yeah, and yeah, the whole yeah. thing and they had live musicians and it was awesome and i i thought it was fantastic i'd love to see more of that also in the same season we did a collaboration with a local up and coming chef mm-hmm. and oh. they I, I i loved this concert so much um but the chef didn't know anything about classical music so for half of the program i gave them uh, program notes, um, like the history of the piece, the story, why it was written and all the yeah. context that comes with classical uh, music. And then for the other half, I let them have free reign on what they created just based on what they listened to. And then they needed to explain what they heard and create hors d'oeuvres that matched each piece. And so this was in 2011. Oh, wow. And um, and then we obviously needed some sort of translator, right? So we had James Chato host the concert and he reviews restaurants yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and wine and all the things. Wonderful person, loves classical music. So it was all very linked together. And then also we partnered with Kerner Hall because it was uh, their, I think it was their 25th anniversary season. And they, uh, we did a, a co-production with them uh, as well in that season and ended up succeeding based yep. on this piggybacking with uh, other cultural institutions helping us along with some operating costs and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, it was not a cheap season there were some expenses that needed to, to happen in order for it to, to work. But um, at the end of the day, everyone helping each other helped, helped an organization really up the bar. Um, and I'm not saying it had anything to do with all of that collaboration, but then they won the, the Juno that year. Hey, oh, <laughs> you, I mean, you and I are on text about this all the time. We we actually exist in abundance, but we're taught that it's scarcity, that there's, we have no chance in this industry, but that's because we look inward, 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 instead of, you know, where there's money, hospitality and food, you know, what people, you know, what's sensual, you know, opera and vibrating in your body and having these like big, intense ex emotional experiences and then eating incredible food and, and wine tasting. Also. It's all right there. And again, there's abundance. There are so many people who are making these connections, uh, but we are not, that is not, that message is not being disseminated to the generations coming up, which you know, is another thing you and I talk about a lot, music education and how, how can we better prepare, uh, not just opera singers, but classical music, classical musicians and, and performing artists in general for the reality of, you know, post-graduation of, of the professional world. And one of these ways we have to, they have to learn about those kinds of projects, but then they have to learn what it takes to implement them. So we need to be teaching kids, not only that there are many possibilities and that we're not sort of, it's not all over in 20 years for opera, which is the message that is consciously and subconsciously uh, fed us. Instead, um, we need to teach them strategic thinking. We need to sit them down with an org chart. Do you understand how an opera company functions? Of course they don't. No one's ever taught them. Mm -hmm. You know, or generally, how does that compare to uh, a consulting firm? How does that compare to a tech startup? How does the world work? Basically, we're not teaching musicians because once they understand those sort of general frameworks and mental models, then they can start to make those connections as you have done and I'm starting to do. And, and many of us in the industry are starting to do. Um, but we have to teach the up coming young musicians differently in this way, more critical thinking, more strategic thinking, right? I'm working on a couple projects bringing, I already do uh, workshops for MBAs mm -hmm. at a couple of universities, but I'm working on some projects bringing music kids and MBA kids together. And I mean, kids, I mean, they're not that young, whatever, by the time they're doing their MBA, but for all intents and purposes, bringing them together to say, 
you see the world completely differently than you see the world. So talk to each other, you know, let's, let's, where are the commonalities? Where are the differences? What kind of questions do you ask each other that someone in your own sector would never think to ask because they would think it obvious or, you know, we all, we all sort of don't know what we don't know. Right. And so I appreciate the connections that you're making. It's yeah. Cool. I think, I think ultimately it's about having an open mind and going into these experiences uh, with that open mind and readiness to experience something new, because there is also a group of people who are not open to new experiences and then limiting themselves yeah. to only a, only the experience they've always had. Um, and that you see a lot of if you go to a new music concert or something mm -hmm. like that, where they may not enjoy that piece of music, but it's, it's not because that piece of music is terrible or anything. Sometimes you have to hear it three or four times before you can really understand it or, or get into the vibe of that thing. And it's the same thing with all of, all of these conversations that we're, that we're talking about here. Oh, and it's, we need to create cultivated citizens, right? Art can do that and music can do that, but you have to take people by the hand also. So don't ask them to sit through a four hour opera all the time. There's a place for that, you know? Uh, bring them to something maybe contemporary, a story in their own language, vernacular perhaps, you know, whatever. We all know sort of many of the ways we can uh, remove some of those barriers to entry. A couple things that you and I talk about a lot. The arts organizations are still, for all the government money they receive, and I write about this a lot too, <laughs> for all the government money they receive, they are absolutely absent in terms of being out and in the community and in events that are not directly related to niche on niche on niche opera or, you know, strings or classical music or whatever. We are woefully underrepresented out in other other events, other milieu to challenge ourselves to just be known and then go together, not just one arts institution. I want to see four coordinate and strategically start going to the chambers of commerces. Yeah. <laughs> Is that even the right collective noun? Well, you, you know what I mean. Obviously, that's a great thing. I think ultimately the reason why those things aren't happening is that they're under-resourced, you know, yes. it's like they're too big and then people are wearing too many hats and then they get stressed. There is a lot of burnout in the arts. So there is yeah. there is a circular issue here with the way that the workflow happens and we've all seen it and it's, yep. and it's a challenge. Of course, these are all great ideas and this is this is where where we need to go. I guess it's sort of a, maybe there just needs to be a focus on doing like one project in the yeah. year to start yeah. where it's a hundred percent the focus of collaborating, you know, and making it more bite-sized for these bigger mm -hmm. organizations so that they can say, all right, this is, we have six productions, say, for, let's just throw that out there. Um, who knows what, what the company is. And, um, <laughs> and then and then we, we're going to also have this collaborative event that we put on and see, see what happens with that. And what is that? More agility. You're right. The first time we don't have to iterate on a sort of a grandiose scale. Absolutely not. Yeah. Bite size. It's good, good, good phrase. And however, you know, we also need, uh, evangelists the way to, you're right. Companies are under-resourced but they also lack good leadership. So I've called out and I'll continue to call out the lack of charismatic leadership in arts institutions in Canada. It's not that there aren't some good leaders, but we need a lot more and we need them out in front of the public a lot more. And that is one way. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. There are no silver bullets, but we absolutely need better leadership. I, for one, our tax dollars pay their salary. I, for one, demand better leadership in the arts in my country. Um, and I recognize that for some of those institutions, it is difficult to compete with the private sector because they can't offer the compensation. That's why I advocate for a lot more artists in positions of leadership because they might 
at first take a pay cut if they are, you know, trained not only as artists, but perhaps they went and got an MBA, perhaps who knows what maybe they are entrepreneurs, doesn't matter, right? But the fact that they could bring those transferable skills to bear and then start leading arts organizations, they are charismatic. They can speak to why this is worth getting behind, you know, on a national scale, on a big city scale, you know, whatever we're talking about. Until we get more charismatic leadership, we are going to struggle to, as you say, get better resourced because a thing that a charismatic leader can do is raise money. And the thing, you and I know this well, and I talk about this a lot, I do not accept Again, this idea that, oh, fundraising, it, 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 it is challenging, but the money is everywhere. This city and this country is very rich, actually. Just in this city alone, we are not leveraging, we are not making the connections, we're not thinking strategically because we lack the leaders to do it. The leaders who frankly give it. I have to say that on, on, on that sort of topic of you know, back to circling back to that partnership thing. When I did reach out to TIFF about Amici doing the concert with them, I guess that must have been 2010. They they were just thrilled about this idea. You know, they yeah. were thrilled about the partnership. And uh, oftentimes I think that we'll be surprised by the reaction that the company or corporation will have. Uh, that's my philosophy with everything. Ask, 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 ask. Always ask, even if you think the answer is going to be no, 90% of the time, because 10% of the time, it's going to be a surprising yes. We need more, yeah. more ask. <laughs> more. I was just going to ask you, what do you think? <laughs> ask you. And you, that's, it, I couldn't agree more. Ask more, be bolder. We're very, oh, this always gets me in trouble. We're very Canadian, you know? <laughs> We're very apologetic. We're very nice. We fetishize how polite we are. Well, raising money and being passionate is not a polite exercise. It simply <laughs> isn't. It requires some ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it requires uh, requires passion, which uh, you know artists and 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 creatives can can lend in, in spades. I agree with you. Ask, ask, ask again. The money is out there. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of money. Let's go to your column from the winter issue, because it yeah. wasn't a column, it was a feature, and it was entitled The New Patronage, and yeah. you were specifically talking about how to handle big philanthropists and what they want from the experience and why, why they might give you a yes. Being an Italian citizen, Canadian citizen, growing up and seeing the difference in arts funding models between Europe and North America. Okay. But then even more starkly and more sort of in a quotidian way here, we're seeing the difference between America and Canada. And of course, America's arts funding is built on individual or family patronage. That's the history of, of, of how that sort of came up. And we could be doing a lot more of that in Canada because we're a younger country. So we have newer multimillionaires and billionaires, right? And we're talking about patrons. Of course, they don't all have to all be the super rich, but it's not a bad place to start <laughs> because oftentimes they are already philanthropic. They already have foundations, you know, family foundations. There is a history in their family of giving to something. And I want a little bit more of that money in, in Canada to start to go to the arts. Another thing we fetishize, and I think deservedly in our country, is our healthcare system. And weirdly, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but it's like somewhat counterintuitively, we have public health care, but it's the number one thing people also give to philanthropically, which is sort of interesting to me as a paradigm. But I guess because it's part of our national pride, we're very proud of it. It also makes sense, you know practically give to hospitals, but I would like a little bit more of patronage to start going to the arts. Right. Um, that Number is, it has to be education. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's true. I, I don't remember. Do you remember? Do you know? I know that number one is healthcare. I don't know what, what I don't know, is. but number two has to be education. And I think that arts, as we've also had in previous conversations that have not been on this podcast, arts education is a real 
a really big and important issue that we need to address in our industry in order to create the diversity that we are longing for. It's a systemic issue and we need to educate kids from the age of four or five. If you talk to any professional instrumentalist, you'll ask, when did you start playing? The answer is usually when they're four or five years old. Our big presenters that have more, I guess, more money at their fingertips or more opportunity for getting out into the community mm -hmm. could expand on their educational outreach programs yeah. to include those younger uh, potential patrons, really. Well, and I actually think that this is an area to explore more in terms of grant matching. So many of the grants available for art funding are education based. So we could be soliciting if any fundraisers are listening and they don't already do this, we could be soliciting individual patrons of certain income bracket to match the granting or vice versa, right? Whichever way that works best synergistically. I totally agree. And we can all get behind children's education. That's an, that seems like relatively low hanging fruit where we also are, you know, solving multiple problems at once, getting a far broader swath of children from different backgrounds exposed to art, right? Creating a pipeline so that in 20 years, 15 years, we have uh, stages that better reflect our country. But that the problem with that is it doesn't happen overnight. That's a pipeline that takes time to do meaningfully and properly it takes a generation it takes time oh, yeah. um, and it takes funding. It takes runway of years of committed funding, not ad hoc funding, mm -hmm. right? It takes people and fundraisers who can strategically ask, make, make the case for give me three or five years spread out as, you know, gifts over time, longer commitments. And then by the way, when we have these artists who are grown and in our communities, even if, this mu music education does not produce, and of course it won't, right? Uh, ROI isn't just how many professional performers we have, right? The ROI is far greater than this. And again, I'm not saying anything that we don't already know, but making the case for why people who've never funded the arts should fund the arts. ROI means that when we have these musicians trained to think as creatives and musicians think, they are incredibly valuable in other sectors as well. And this is proven now. I mean, there's, there's data on this. You can, you can read, there are talent and hiring trend reports, right? Big data from LinkedIn and McKenzie and Deloitte that they're doing every year or two years. And over and over again, the skills that are most in demand are the critical thinking and soft skills, right? It's all the EQ because, and, and the HR managers will say, we can train anybody in the technical skill. What we need are people who can work on a team. What we need are people who have emotional intelligence, self-awareness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and musicians learn this, right? They're, that's part of music education. So we're actually producing really well-rounded citizens. And that's the biggest ROI, I think, for music education. Um, because talent, really, really talented kids in that upper echelon, music will out, right? They will find mm -hmm. it's, it's, but I want to capture far more kids to create more, frankly, more interesting Canadians. Like, Music and art makes people more interesting. And a pitch, last thing I'll say about, about that education piece, and another way I wish that we pitched funding for music education, when you are moving up a ladder in a company, any company in any sector, distinguishing yourself as being able to speak intelligently to art, music, anything like that, that you have not only attended performances, but you actually understand the music history, the theory, you've practiced it yourself. This distinguishes you to your superiors. It just does. It's an incredible networking tool. Also, there's so much value to music education that we, we have not even close to juiced. There's a verb in Italian, sfruttare, right? <laughs> and it's like to really like juice the last drop out of out of um, out of a concept, and that's what we should be doing with music education. When you talk about musicians, uh, performing artists, being good at people skills, communicating, and that kind of thing, I mean, they learn how to communicate through their eyes. You know, yeah. when they're making 
when you make music with somebody, you have to respond through the through body language. Like you can't be like, I'm going to now play the note, okay? Or I'm going to sing now. You have to feel each other and you have to be on the same page. That is the skill, right? That is that you are communicating without talking. And so that's what you learn. You learn how to, to read people. And that's, again, I teach this, right? When you talk about communicating non-verbally, which is exactly what you're talking about, team building. How about all of the permutations now of work culture, all the ways that's changing. And one way we can be more agile is be like an opera singer. Every two months, I got to show up to the first day of school and I have to bond, so to speak, immediately and create trust, a foundation of trust on day one with my colleagues so that, and a lot of that is nonverbal, exactly as you say, so that we can take emotional and vulnerable steps, you know, toward each other to make something beautiful and real and sort of truthful. So yeah, that it's incredibly valuable. And you're right. Chamber music, thinking about it in that sort of framework. I'm curious, has Ben, does Ben ever do these kinds of workshops? Does he ever talk? He must ta- speak to, he must get asked to do this kind of thing. No, you're referring to my husband, Ben Bowman. Ben uh, Bowman. <laughs> He is the, yes, concert master at the Met. Heard of yeah. that? Um, he has not done any um, workshops r- workshops on this, but I do note when yeah. he's playing uh, the amount of communication that is happening during those performances. And it's really amazing like to see. Yeah. And also conductors. I mean, conductors are fascinating. I mean, their instrument is their, is their body. Yeah. A hundred percent. Anyway, uh, we, I could talk to you all day. And I, know. I, would like to, I, would, I would like to have you on the podcast again. I'm really enjoying reading your stage business and essential perspectives columns and also the occasional features. So thank you so much for writing for, for Opera Canada. Uh, it's so great to have your presence. Love your, your perspective and what you bring to everything here. And I hope everyone is reading the summer issue right now that's on, on the shelves and enjoying Lucia's piece on opera evangelists check it out oh thanks lizzie it's a pleasure pleasure to be here and um we need to cheerlead for opera as you are doing as i try and do so thanks thanks for having me it's a pleasure